Hey folks, Tom Oprey here with the Shepherds of Wildlife Society from the great state of Montana. And I am on the Archery Outdoorsman podcast. Yeah, you get a hell of a lot better introduction so. than I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, fellow Montana man, <laughs> yeah, that's I'm here right. to I'm here to support right. you, brother. Yeah, well, so. I appreciate it, man. I really do. Uh, Poma has been an absolute like great. Well, for people that don't know what Poma is, yeah. the Professional Outdoor Media Association. So I'm I'm a past president, so I'm a second generation outdoor communicator. My dad was uh, in was an outdoor writer for 30 years for Outdoor Life and Film Stream, and so I kind of grew up around uh, what was uh, an early organization called the Outdoor Writers Association of America, which actually based in Missoula, believe it or not. But uh, Poma kind of was a, a growth out of that, and uh, it's been around for about 14 years, and it's made up of uh, you know, some of the coolest, most innovative outdoor communicators in the world, not just writers, but filmmakers, videographers, still photographers, bloggers, podcasters, you know, I mean, YouTubers, anybody who loves and is passionate about the outdoors and likes to communicate about it, uh, Poem is a place for them. Yeah, and it, it's definitely rang true. I mean, it, everybody's on fire for outdoor conservation, media, just everything uh bringing in new hunters kids all that family values everything um so i guess one of the huge things that i wanted to talk to you about is uh well when we talked a, a little bit at length last night uh about africa right you just came back from a, a leopard hunt yeah, no, we're, you know, I've been a filmmaker for almost 30 years now and, uh, you know, started off in the feature film business. I've done Shark Week for Discovery Channel. I've been involved in a lot of real high-end film productions and, and print advertising stuff. Shot Rolls-Royce for the, the new SUV earlier this year in Montana. We did a little winter shoot down at uh, the lodge at uh, Rock Creek outside of Peaberg. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just been my life. It's been a passion, been around it all the time. And I, I had a show on NBC sports called, uh, Eye of the Hunter that was on prime time, like Mondays at 9 PM Eastern. So we're up against Monday night football on ABC. So, you know, we had the largest audience of any outdoor show in the world. And, uh, uh, in 2015, uh, uh, an unknown lion to the rest of the world, at least to, uh, the people of Zimbabwe named Cecil or Cecil. Mm -hmm got smacked uh, outside of the Wangi National Park by a hunter on a legal hunt. Uh, we've all heard about Dr. Uh, oh, what is his name? The Minnesota dentist. That, yeah, I don't uh, remember his name. Oh, yes, I, I know it, but a brain fart here. But anyways, um, yeah, the lion got shot. And we had a contract to be on NBC through uh, 2018. And after the end, I was actually in... Uh, we were uh, hunting alpine ibex in Switzerland. I was in Grenoble one evening after hunting all day, and I got a phone call from NBC, and they said, hey, just want to let you know we're, we're, we're no longer going to air this kind of any outdoor programming. And, uh, you know, I was, we had a whole season in the can, and it's like, what the hell is this all about, you know? Oh, that's and awesome. uh, they just they lost their balls to promote wise, sound management of our wild resources, our wild places, and the animals that live in them. And uh, from there, you know, we, we decided that, um, you know, obviously there's some issues. We did some real soul searching about what we wanted to do, why we wanted to do it. And as my wife and I, my wife uh, uh, is a hunting consultant and um, has a background in, in the outdoor industry. And that uh, she was uh, used to work at Cabela's. She was Marion Dick Cabela's, the founder's personal assistant for about five years. And she was Mrs. Nebraska in 2003. And she, uh, she ran on a platform of you have to have a you know, some sort of cause that you, you push. And hers was about the hunter being the ultimate conservationist for wildlife. And so for since 2003, she's been, you know, <laughs> a lightning rod <laughs> yeah. for the anti-hunters because here's this hot blonde, you know, who talks about hunting and it's hunted all the world. Hell, she's killed more shit than I have. Um, but uh, better shot. I can tell you she's a whole lot better on the eyes too. So, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's really, we looked at things and we said, hey man, there's, there's some issues here. You know, of course, the biggest issue is the vast majority of, of our 
Western, and I say this in quotes, educated society, is that we're completely ignorant to what goes on in, in wild places. You know, I mean, back in the day, I mean, there's a reason why campfires mesmerize all of us. I don't care if you live in uh, L.A. or Chicago or some other part of the world or you live in Nome, Alaska. Um, it's because, you know, and it has nothing to do with s'mores and roasted marshmallows. You know, but that's it goes back to our basic DNA, and hunting is a part of that basic DNA. And so we looked at what was going on, and it was like, shit, we got all these people that don't understand what's going on. They're willing to support uh, causes and organizations like the Humane Society of the United States or the Center for Biological Diversity. And I'm like, well, what are they doing for wildlife conservation? Because I've been involved in Ducks Unlimited and, you know, Wild Sheep Foundation. I'm a life member. I've been involved in a lot of these NGOs that, are, that really put the, you know, the rubber to the road. They actually create you know, and, and enhance and, or protect uh, and conserve habitat for these animals. And, you know, obviously the North American wildlife conservation model is the greatest wildlife conservation, uh, you know, uh, model that's ever existed on the planet Earth. And several places yeah. around the world have, have actually said the exact same thing. We wish we could emulate the North American model. And I guess I could say we'll then emulate it. But well, and they do. So, you know, the IUCN, just, just to kind of touch on this, IUCN is an, an you know, entity that's kind of like the UN. of it's, it's recognized by the world as the world's most authority on wildlife populations and their health and so forth. And they came out in 2016 with a paper that said it was about trophy hunting, which there's no such thing as trophy hunting, so I get tired of hearing this. When you hunt, you hunt. You kill an animal. There's nothing about it. I mean, if you decide to keep a trophy, great, but that's not why we hunt. Um, so the reality that I saw there when they did this report, they came out and they said, listen, there's only two places in the world where wildlife populations are growing and doing well. North America, based on the North American Wildlife Conservation Model, where our founding fathers were smart enough to say, hey, the wildlife belongs to all of us. Not to the land not, not to the to the the landowners. You know? Mm -hmm. As a landowner, you have to be a good steward of that wildlife. But we pay for the management, the people. And we can hunt those animals. You don't own them as far as the free-range animals that go here you know, throughout the United States. Um, the other thing we've got going on is that, you know, other than North America, was Southern Africa. And that was because of, you know, originally they, they started running cows and, and goats and, and sheep and whatnot, just like we did in North America. And, uh, but, you know, it's a pretty harsh environment. Africa is, I mean, it's, people have to understand, Africa is a continent, it's not a country. As a huge Africa continent. is big enough to swallow North America, South America, Europe, India, and a few other places right. within its confines. And extremely diverse landscapes. I, yeah, Ethiopia, tens of, I mean, I don't know what the mountains are, 16, 18,000 feet. Um, a beautiful country uh, that's for coffee. You know, they, they grow yeah, coffee the there. I mean, they'll tie I mean, coffee, really, yeah. well, that's it's, it's where it comes from, you know. So the reality is, is that, you know, they've got such a wide uh, diversity of habitat and ecosystems. But um, the southern African ranchers found, you know, you know, it's pretty logical, common sense that wildlife, kudu, you know, hemsbuck, wildebeest, even the, you know, the, the bigger species like the rhino and the elephant, well, they evolved to live on that country, whereas the domesticated species didn't. And so what they found was that they could grow these animals like livestock, but they're, they're, not, they're wild, they're out running around, and these, you know, but it is high fence, most mm -hmm. of it is, but pretty big such stuff. It's not little 40, 80 acre enclosures. These are tens of thousands of acres. Uh, some of them are, are literally conservancies where 30, 40 ranches all get together and they knock down all the fences between them and there could be a million acres, you know, or a million and a half acres with a fence just around its perimeter. And they found and realized a value from the wildlife there through hunting and also, you know, through other sustainable uses of them, you know, whether it be breeding or selling animals for their meat, you know, in the market. And so those two places, according to the IUCN, are the only two places in the world where wildlife is growing and is healthy and vibrant populations. So you, you just brought up something that is a really hot topic. And I've got to be honest there for a while um, up until more recently. <clears throat> and I guess it, maybe you could understand this too from being in Montana and being able to hunt on public land and all that kind of stuff. You've got like a million, million and a half acres in like the Lewis and Clark. I think it's a million in the uh, 
Lewis and Clark National Forest, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at these high fence, you know, and you get this idea that high fence hunting, you know, you've got this, these animals are all trapped in this small little area. They can't go anywhere. It's just the word fence. Right. You know, but let's face it. I mean, animals are constrained by many things. It could be development, roads, railroads. Uh, it could be waterways. It could be a river or lake or something where they can't cross it. Um, and humanity, you know, because of land ownership, you know, we have a tendency to put fences up. And when you put those fences up, you know, you res- can restrict that. But in Africa, the fences typically aren't meant to, uh, in a lot of cases, it's meant to keep the rest of the riffraff out. Uh, you know, I mean, there's we can show you so many examples, visual examples of where you go from outside of these hunting areas into these conservancies where there's a game fence there. And the animals are trying to, on the outside, are trying to break in because it's a Valhalla with inside there of habitat. Plenty of food, other animals, all that. And where it's, it's denuded, there's people all over the place, there's livestock, literally right up to those fences. And that's something where I've... There's no hunting there. And even though the you know, outside of those areas, you know, and so the ranchers there, you know, I mean, you know, there is always the issue of, you know, okay, I, I'm personally, I've, I've actually come up, uh, you know, if your viewers and listeners want to go to the shepherds of wildlife.org, which is our nonprofit or 501c3. Um, I have one of our big pitches right now that we really think, you know, and we'll get back into some of this other stuff. But one of the things that we really believe in is there needs to be an ethics reset in hunting. Oh, and we have a, a yeah. principles of modern ethical hunter and, and it's meant to create conversation it's not uh it's not the the ten commandments or anything like that it's not that thou shall only do these things but one of the things we talk about in there is hunt, only hunting animals that are in areas that uh mimic their habitat and their range so if a white-tailed deer you know based on science a doe needs 20 acres then you better have 20 acres for every deer every white-tailed deer a white-tailed buck might need 200 acres and that's based on science now there's going to be give and take here and there but you got to make sure that those animals can live a natural life they have the ability to get away from anybody you can't you know otherwise it's just livestock right so and, and, and that's that's where you know like i said i was I, I was a little bit opposed to it because i could not conceptualize okay, well, they're in this thousand acre thing. And it, like, how big is a thousand acres when you're used to hunting on a million acres of public land? You yeah, but I in mean? Africa, you're not looking at thousand acres. You're looking usually at five, 10, 25, 30, 50,000 acres. Right. And then these conservancies right. are literally 800,000 to a million, two million acres with just Ooh. perimeter fencing on them. And I mean, look, I'm heading to the Savi Valley Conservancy with this fountain safaris next mo- uh, week from this Friday. And literally, we're in a 980,000-acre conservancy, and the big five is there. You know, rhino, elephant, cape buffalo, crocodile, you know, everything there. Yeah, and leopard. you can walk four miles. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're, you, know, you don't see, you don't, you don't, you don't, you, don't th- see, uh, you see a fence at the road when you come off the hard road, off the tar road, but then you, there's never, you don't ever see another fence again. Yeah, so. yeah, so that's, that was one of the things. And if you like, go walking like said, for miles, you better be taking a gun, because there's a good chance you're going to get eight. Yeah, that's that's the other thing, too, that with the hunting in Africa and stuff like that, you know, people were all upset about, you know, Cecil the lion and, uh, and you know, these big cats getting killed. And they I don't think people understand the the danger that a lot of those people are in. I don't think they um uh, they don't look at lions the same way that we do here. You're talking about the indigenous communities, the local right, people there. Right. Yeah, no, they don't. I mean, let's face it. Um, you know, we're seeing an issue with grizzly bears in Montana. I mean, you go right. to Val- 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 Valier and you got grizzly bears walking around the school. Uh, you know, people get a little upset about that because, you know, we haven't dealt with grizzly bears walking around our schools in 100 years. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden now we got grizzly bears walking around. You know, it'd be like, you know, having a you know a couple pedophiles walking around your playground. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a problem, right? Right. And I'm not saying that, that, that grizzly bears are a bad thing. They're an incredibly beautiful creature. They're a great spiritual creature. They're very in, in integral part of that ecosystem, part of our – all predators are. We can't ever abolish predators we have to nurture them we have to take care of them and that, that's let's face it folks there's not an animal that's been managed through well-regulated hunting that has ever gotten you know put on the endangered species right. list. if anything key, it's been the opposite and so the key there is well-regulated 
Yeah. Scientifically right. based right. ranch hunting. Because, you know, all we're looking at, no matter what state, what province, or what part of the world, you're looking at a 3 to 5% offtake. And they've already factored in natural mortality, predation, mm-hmm. whatever the factors are going on with the environment, whether it be drought, uh, whether it be forest fires, whatever those issues are. Wildlife managers, they're scientists, they're biologists, they have degrees, and their whole job is to make sure that these ecosystems are healthy. Well, and when they talked about the um, delisting of the grizzly and stuff, they even took into account that if another bear died, like they would give out a certain number of tags, and if one other bear died that you know they didn't account for, then they, they lose a tag. Yeah, we just we have a project out right now uh, on our wildlife conservation project. Uh, go to Facebook; you can watch that, or even on Instagram. Uh, also, Amazon Video Direct. If you go, just Google or just go ahead and type in in the search engine on Amazon uh, wildlife conservation project. You'll you'll find our stuff. We've got a project out on grizzly bears, and uh, what we do is we bring in subject matter experts. So the scientists, the biologists, world class wildlife photographers like fellow Montana and Tony Bynum. Uh, we bring in world-class uh, artists like John Banovich, great wildlife artist, known all over the all over the place, and uh, they have the ability to tell the story of good wildlife conservation. You know, as far as what needs to be done and what man's responsibility is to the animals and their habitat, because you know, let's face it, the old white guy is come in stereotyped by the anti-hunting right. industry as just being this kind of colonial, this you, know, you know, kinda. egocentric, you know, yeah. hey, the, 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 these guys, they don't really care about anything. It's all about their egos, you know. And unfortunately, that does a huge disservice to wildlife conservation. So we get, bring these people in to tell the right story, and we wrap these these multimedia campaigns. You know, we got guys like Tony film, you know, shooting pictures for us. We're out filming stuff. And we let them tell that story, and we wrap it into this uh, – you know, the, the story of sustainable utilization, i.e. hunting. Right. And so, and why we hunt, and for the right reasons. It's not about tape measures. It's not about record books. It's about consumption, but it, more importantly, it's about being an active participant in a world where the vast majority of the population no longer is connected to that wild interface. You know, most people in, uh, and, I, and I say this loosely or, in, you know, in quotes, you know, Western educated society when they wake up in the morning they flip a switch they expect the electricity to turn the lights on they don't know if it's coal power if it's you know uh you know it's come from meth you know gas right and most or, of you them know, don't or solar it. but they don't they don't care and then the next thing is they walk in the bathroom flush the toilet out of sight out of mine yep. you know their shit and piss is going to go somewhere and somebody's gonna have to deal with it especially right. if they're living in the cities the next big decision of the day is it a chai latte or a caramel macchiato right you know, so the thing about the hunter, the hunter interacts with the wild, you know, the nature, the, the wildland interface. And so they see these things. And that's why we, we started the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. It's made up of, uh, of photographers and filmmakers that have this intimate, you know, relationship with all things wild. We make a living looking at it and seeing it every day. And if it disappears, then we can't make a living. But we're all animals in this, on this world. We are a part of this ecosystem, and every decision somebody in L.A. or New York or Great Falls makes in town, mm-hmm. buying decisions, writing a check to the Humane Society of the United States, which I call the Antichrist of wildlife conservation, but, you know, that has an impact. Signing a petition to ban the importation of, of trophy animal parts uh, from Africa. Yeah, like Connecticut. Yeah, right well, they tried to do that stuff, and, 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 and it's nothing but the Antichrist. They, every person who signs that is not a wildlife conservationist. Right. Look at BC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BC British government, a, a, yeah, exactly. British Columbia government, NDP. You know, they they politicized. Now we're seeing that we're seeing the politicization of wildlife conservation. Politicians will use a highly charged emotional plank within their campaign. We saw it in Maryland last spring. Vote for me, and I will ban black bear hunting. Well, they got more black bear they know what to do with. And there's a human bear conflict that's unbelievable, just like we're having with grizzly bears. Yeah. You know, and you go to Alaska, and you, they hunt grizzly, they hunt brown bear. And you run into a 1,000-pound brown bear out there, you know, on the, on the coastal range, you know, and you're running around. As soon as they see you or smell you, almost always, it's exit stage right. Yeah, they they they, they get hunted. But you go to Montana, yeah. and you, the human being is not the, is not the big man on campus. Right. These grizzly bears, they own Everywhere yeah. they step, and yeah, that's was, what they think. Because I was we have it. Somebody here in Poma, I was like, "Look, I'm I'm going to be hunting in GYE, uh, right at the Absorca Beartooth," and they're like, 
oh, okay. And I was like, it's pretty damn dangerous. And they said, why? Bears generally run from people. And I was like, not these bears. No. It's a dinner belt. They yeah. hear around they hear Yellowstone. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we have hunters it. killed and maimed every year in Montana. I've had three friends now that have been attacked by bears. Yeah. Well, we shot an interview with a guy that was ten miles from my house in Columbia Falls last fall that was just walking through some deep brush out hunting, and he got he walked smack dab into a boar, and that boar beat the shit out of him. He had he's had five or six surgeries to fix all the problems that that bear did in about a minute and a half, two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, young guy. He was walking um, yeah. a dry creek bed or something like that, right? No, he was up on a hill there, but he'd gone, he'd, he's only been hunting for a few years, and he's a transplant from, I think, some okay. other part of the you know, Some flatland guy, guy. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But, yeah, he uh, you know didn't have the experience to not go into a thick country. It's like it's going in rattlesnake country. Yeah. You don't walk around in rattlesnake country if you can't see within about three feet around your feet. <laughs> you know? Right. So when you're hunting in, in, in elk, country or where you know you got big grizzly bears around especially ones that don't have respect for man then you know if you're calling elk then you're always watching your back mm-hmm. you're walking around you're always looking over your back because you know it, it, it's every year we have hunters and we have hikers in yellowstone and adjacent areas out there that are being mauled and killed yep. by these bears and, and there's no reason for it because at the end of the day, you know, everything is about carrying capacity. So these bears are going to live in this, in this ecosystem. But they're now, you know, when, when – Yeah, yeah. And when Lewis and Clark came over, you know, after, you know, 1803, 1805, they're in Louisiana Purchase, and they're coming up the Missouri River, coming through Montana. What did they see? Tens of millions of buffalo on the plains. Saw, so, uh, you know, probably tens of millions of elk and deer. I know there was three or four million bighorn sheep out there. But what was the biggest problem they ran into eh, almost every day out there? Grizzlies. Grizzly bears. And the grizzly bears were out there because that's where the food was. Mm-hmm. And then when they went over Lolo Pass, they almost starved to death because there was no wildlife there. It was all down out on the plains. Um, so humanity's driven them, you know, these animals into these, into these remoter areas because of our development and our population growth. Um, so what we have to look at is now what we're seeing is these animals have now surpassed the carrying capacity of Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park and the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And yep. they're now moving the out into their t- stand place. Now yeah. Too. Yeah. They're moving out into their traditional habitat. And we're seeing, like I said earlier, we're seeing bears where we haven't seen them in a hundred years. And the government doesn't do anything to educate us about them. They're like, oh, oh well. Yep. And, you know, I know Tony Biden's told me on camera that he's like, yeah, I think the federal government could be held liable for some of this shit. You know? Yeah, and it would be an interesting concept. It, it, well, I'm, it's a matter of time because we're in a so happy, you know, we don't have any tort reform going on in this country. Well, so. I'll tell you what, if uh, if something happens to me when I'm out there, I'll, I'm going to come talk to you, assuming I live through it, and maybe we'll work something out. Yeah, well, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not getting legal <laughs> advice either. So. But, but, yeah, no, I mean, the reality is, is it's natural. This is what's supposed to happen. These animals are supposed to move in these areas, but they need to have a respect for other animals. And that's what happens in wild. You go to Africa, you know, when the zebras see the lions slinking along, it's like, holy shit, all right, everybody needs to get over here. We need to watch out because one of us is going to get smacked. Um, you know, when it comes to us and what we're doing with it, I mean, we are, I mean, there's not a part of the world that humans don't have an impact. I don't care if you're in the highest yeah. point of the Himalayas on Mount Everest, there is trash everywhere, flags, you know, used oxygen bottles, yeah, fucking we dead bodies. Yeah, we were about that shit this morning yeah. with, uh, with um, Costa and, yeah. you know, all the plastic everywhere and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, oh, no. and, and I say go to the lowest point of the world, which is the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the South Pacific. And ever since that tsunami hit that nuclear plant in Japan, the Fugishima nuclear plant or whatever they call it, I've always said there had to be a bunch of nuclear reactor material down in that thing, too, because that's what it did. It washed the whole thing right out. And I'll be danged if National Geographic didn't do a study a couple of years or pay for a study to happen. And they sampled all the biological creatures in that trench, and they determined that they have been exposed to greater concentrations of pollutants than the most polluted rivers in China today. And China's got some real problems. I mean, I'm, I was there last year. I'm heading back again this year and seeing what's going on there, trying to help them with their natural history museums. And there's a real problem because they have 1.4 billion Chinese in that country. Yeah. And that is the greatest problem to wildlife today. It's not the well-regulated hunting. It's not even the, the, this poaching we hear about in the mainstream media with, with the elephant uh, ivory and the rhino horn. The greatest threat to wildlife, and I don't, it's, the United, it's everywhere, it's the entire planet, is us. It's yep. humanity's 7.5 billion people that is predicted to double in the next 50 years. 
So what happens when all these people come online? You know, well, first of all, you have to have your society wants stability. You know, and what do you have for stability? Well, you need a place to live, right? You need to have a roof over your head. You got to be warm. You have to have a full belly. Yep. So what do we do? We grow more crops. We raise more livestock because we got to feed farming. more people. Factory farming grows exponentially. Um, so you have that scenario there because if you don't have the food, what happens to society? It's, it's going to die out. It I mean, breaks it's down. It bre- yeah, yeah, but it breaks down and we have chaos. Right. And so governments don't want to have chaos. So what do they do? They allow people to continue cutting down more forest and turning it into, you know, whatever, you know, productive lands that they can use in order to grow more food. Mm-hmm. What happens to the wildlife that lives in that habitat? Yeah, they're going to die out. It ceases to exist. Yeah. And, th- and that's one of the things, you know, you get the anti-hunter saying, oh, it's terrible that you guys would kill things, these magnificent creatures. I mean, like, wait a minute. You know, if we don't have habitat, then there's not going to be any reason to argue about if you kill the animals or not because there ain't going to be freaking any animals there. Right. And then that's the reality is that we all have to work together as a species mm-hmm. because we are intelligent, not very intelligent, but we have some idea what's going on. And we have to think outside of our own lives. We have to think outside of just that, you know, 58, 86, whatever time period of years that you're going to be on this planet. And you got to start thinking about what I tell people. Why don't we plan based on ecosystems and the oldest living creature? In them? Where we live in Montana, the oldest living creature is the ponderosa pine. It lives to be 600 years age. Okay. Everything else needs to live in that cycle because it's developed over the millennia and evolved based on that. And I, you know, and I tell people, it's like, it doesn't matter what your religion is or where you come from or what your nationality is. I think we all can agree, as long as humans have walked on two feet, we've hunted. Mm-hmm. Not everybody, but there's always been a segment of the population. Because you go back a thousand years to a village of a hundred people, not a hundred people went hunting. Well, half of them were women usually, or about that, and the other half were men. And of the 50 guys that were there, I can tell you, not all of them were good hunters. Well, even though, and, and I want to bring this up because I had somebody, a, a I'm assuming vegan, uh, that said to me, well, humans back in ancient historical times were vegan. And I was like, <laughs> I was like no, they may not have hunted, but they still gathered. Uh, well, the hunter-gatherer society is what existed initially, and there always has been people hunting. And there's a, re- I mean, there's the, there's an actual record of it for thousands of years, and nobody has stopped hunting. Right now, you can get into a situation where they have obliterated the huntable animals, and they did. I mean, the Romans did the same thing with certain uh, plants and things that used for medicinal things. They, they they some of these things only grow in certain you know areas and certain environments, and when you overharvest them, guess what? There's no left. Right. And so there has, I mean, a lot of people say we're in a major extinction period, you know, that there's more things dying than, than existing here as far as species go. And, you know, I, and I would say that because, you know, I mean, you know, what can live in concrete and asphalt? Right. What can live in steel and glass? Rats. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. when I was in, I was in, uh, in China last year and uh, I was in a, a tier two city called Wuhan and it's 11 million people. And they are growing, they are, you know, the, the, the Chinese are smart in that, that they're growing for, they want to have stability in their population. So they're growing and they're planning for this future growth. So they're literally building, you know, skyscrapers 10 at a time, all identical, but they only have enough people to live in like two or three of them because they think 40 years from now, their population is going to be so big, they have to have places for them. So they're building things that are vacant. So what's a tier two? So it's tier two. So I'm just at the value. So a tier one would be Shanghai. Okay. 40, 50 million people oh, okay. in one city. Gotcha. Yeah, so, that's, that's nuts. So a smaller city yeah. <laughs> is 11 million. You know, New York is only like 12 or 13 million or 14 million, something like that. And that's one of our largest cities. Yeah. But my point is when I was there for two weeks, I didn't see any wildlife. And, and they have trees everywhere. They plant them along the roads. It, it looks like a nursery project because they're all staked together and braced and all that. And they go right down the highways on both sides. They're in the median. There's green everywhere. But there's no wildlife because there's no environment. Just because you plant trees doesn't mean you're going to have a wild place, especially in the middle of your city. I don't think I probably saw 20 or 30 birds the entire two weeks I was there. Wow. I saw one flock of about six or eight pigeons. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> what's happening? Well, whatever's around is getting eight. 
Well, that's, so. there's, there's got to be some truth then to the um, – I saw this documentary a while back, and they were talking about how honeybees were basically, like, gone in certain sections of China mm-hmm. because they – overused pesticides and all kinds of stuff like that mm-hmm. where people actually have to go around to their fruit trees and stuff and pollinate by hand yep. uh, all these different things well and not only that they've done a terrible job with soil so a lot of i tell a lot of people i said let's face it the only reason why humans exist on this planet and it has nothing to do with technology yes technology through modern advancements and science and, and and especially medicine we can prolong our lives we can make our lives more comfortable but it doesn't exist us to, doesn't allow us to exist on the planet. What allows us to exist, every single human being, is nature. Yep. It's the soils. It's where we grow crops. It's where we where our animals live off the, the off the land there, whether it be the, the whatever they're grazing, you know, our livestock and so forth. It is. So if you don't take care of the soil, then you're really in a pickle. And the Chinese have not done a good job of taking care of their soil either. So not only do they have a shitload of people, but they've got some really bad soil conditions. And, they, and they, you know, I mean, go back to the Great Dust Bowl here in, in, in the lower yeah. 48. In the 19, late 20s and 30s, I mean, the farming, you know, they were out there farming some of these prairies that had never been farmed before, put in place, and they weren't meant. They, had, they evolved with a bison, these grasses. And they were never meant to be turned up and ever. And then all of a sudden, you know, it was dry and hot and all the topsoil blew away. And nobody could grow anything because without topsoil, there's no nutrients in the soil. Right. So, you know, we learned a valuable lesson in North America. Now we still have some issues with uh, herbicides, pesticides, and and, uh, fertilizing, you know, nutrient loading in our waters. Because especially, you know, you go down to the Mississippi River and and see what it looks like in the the great dead zone outside of New Orleans there in the the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, that's a travesty. You're looking at about thousands of square miles of just dead zone. I mean, there's nothing living in it because of the overload of nutrients and, and pesticides. And, you know, could we do something about it? Hell yeah, we can. And we're going to have to if we're going to live on this planet. We're going to have, you know, 15 billion humans on this planet. And that's in the next 50 years. So that's in your lifetime that yep. you're going to see this. I probably won't see it. But the reality is, is I'm going to see the, the beginnings of some major chaos in this planet. So being a hunter is the ultimate wildlife and habitat conservation. It's you're, you are paying for conservation in North America. If you, we travel abroad, you are creating value on the ground so that indigenous communities, you know, this is, let's face it, I don't care where you go in the world, if wildlife doesn't have a value, it doesn't exist. And if there's somebody in Tajikistan that, uh, you know, they've got Mark Horse sheep there and some hunters willing to pay $110,000 to come there. Now, does all the 110000 go to the local village? No, but a lot of times they'll get five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 U.S. And you got to remember, these are in countries. Well, money. yeah, it's, I mean, you get exchange rates and things like that. I mean, you know, go down to Mexico someday. What is it, 20 some pesos to the dollar now? So yeah. you go buy a, a, a $50 steak and it costs you like five bucks, you know? Right. You know, I mean, it's like, it's well, that's two bucks, you know, right. based on what's going on. Now, of course, they've jacked their prices up, but still, you're paying pennies on the dollar for what you would pay for this stuff. But these people are getting huge. I mean, they're getting jobs. They're making money. Uh, in some cases, like in Africa, there's, there's a protein source that they get the food. But it's not about just that. It's about paying for the conservation on the ground, paying for the science, paying for the anti-poaching efforts. And it's creating a value and a pride of ownership. Because you got to remember, these are sovereign countries. They don't come over here and say, hey, by the way, you can't shoot any antelope this year in Montana because we don't think you got enough of them. So Montana, the country of Zambia, says you can't go. Right. Well, what are you going to say? Yeah. Screw you. I'm going to lift a finger to you. Yeah. Okay. So what is it that we can go over there and say, oh, by the way, we don't think you should be hunting lions and elephants and and, uh, rhinos. I've never understood the – the mentality that it's okay to hunt in the United States. And I've, I've seen other hunters like cannibalize each other about going over and hunting a lion in, or an elephant or whatever. Yeah. And I've never understood how they could sit on a platform and say, it's okay to hunt in the United States. It's okay to hunt deer, elk, or any It's animal. okay if you're going to put it in the pot. But it's not okay, or, or it's not okay to hunt it with modern archery tech, or it's not okay to use it if you're using bait, or it's not okay to use it if you're going to shoot long range, or it's not okay to use it if you're going to hunt behind a fence that's more than three and a half feet tall. Here's the deal. We're talking about ethics. Ethics are your own personal deal. I mean, if you want to hunt behind a high fence 
and that animal lives within an area that's that mimics its natural range and habitat and all that and it actually can get away you know i mean i don't have a problem with that but as long as there's no scientific biological issue now we have big issues with disease now that have been you know being transported chronic wasting disease here and we've got yeah, a real problem a with now thing. in montana but that'll be for another talk but when we have hunters fighting hunters yep hunters are doing huge disservice to wildlife and habitat conservation we have a real problem with uh, i call it the dirty three-letter word in wildlife conservation today especially in north america ego yep when I grew up hunting, you know, my dad was an outdoor writer, you know, I, I, very, he didn't make any money. So, I mean, we had to have deer, we had to have turkey, we had salmon, you know, growing up in Michigan where I was, we had a lot of wild game in the freezer and, it, and it, we needed it because that really off, you know, that made it, the quality of our life increase substantially. But I watched hunting, which has primarily historically been a, what I call a biocentric approach to hunting. So it's been about food. It's been about, obviously, you know, we had tools and clothing and all that. But since that time in modern times, it also was, a, you know, there's a lot of tradition in hunting. You know, I think it made us better people. The relationships we had, the time we spent at our deer leases or in the, on the farm or oh, absolutely or whatever yeah. we're sharing together. And um, in the last four decades, I've watched it kind of more from this biocentric approach to what I call an egocentric approach. It's, and, and it's not the hunter's fault, you know, but I think it has to come from commerce. So when you want to s differentiate your product or your hunt, you know, guns, bows, you know, bullets, optics, or your, your hunting trip, you know, your deer hunt, your elk hunt, your moose hunt, whatever it is, you want to differentiate your stuff from the competitor because there's other people trying to sell that stuff. You have to come up with some way to do it. Well, hey, guess what? We got this handy thing called the record books from Boone and Crockett. Oh, we have these handy thing called the record books at SCI, Safari Club International. You know what? Joe over here got more booners using my broadhead than any other broadhead out there. So I'm going to market my broadhead as the best broadhead to use to get more records. Yeah. And that's going to motivate people to go hunt. Now, is it the hunter's fault? No, but that's the off, you know, it, it's, it's what's come off of, of commerce here. But what it's exposed to, and, and it, you know, it is what it was for years and years. And then back in the late 90s, mid 90s, you know, the internet started to rear its head. And then, of course, the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, and then especially in 2014, 15, Sassel the Lion. Anybody who has a smartphone now has access to a fire hose of information that has no checks and balances, seconds. no editorial uh, overview or nothing. And it, you know, we talk about, you know, the president talks about fake news and, you know, we have all these things. It's propaganda and it's been weaponized by the anti-hunting community which are the antichrist of wildlife conservation you know they don't put any dollars on wildlife conservation they don't put any freaking rubber you know they don't put any rubber on the road they don't put boots on the ground except for in the state capitals and congress well, trying to talk and supporting politicians to ban hunting well, then they don't know what it's like in these areas. I mean, just because of what you said, they don't, they're not Again, out there. Again, the value. But here's the problem in this, is that we live in a representative democracy. It's one of the yeah. most incredible countries ever, ever in the history of this planet and humankind. But you and I live in a state that has citizen initiatives, which means if you get enough people to sign a petition in every single voting district, They'll put it on the ballot. You know what that is? It's called mob rules. Now, we've had, what, three anti-poaching or not anti-trapping anti initiatives yeah. in Montana on the ballot. And we have the highest per capita number of hunters of any state in the union. And it's getting 40 to 45 percent of the vote. That's a problem because these people are disconnected. And so if we only, based on the last numbers I saw from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, there's about... I don't know, 12, 13 million people that buy hunting licenses. This has been as high as maybe 17, 18 million, uh, depending on what year it is and whatnot. But we only represent about 5% of the population. Well, last time I checked, you win an election with 50% plus one vote. Right. So that means in order for us to win an election, and I mean by defeat someone who's trying to politicize wildlife conservation by banning trophy hunting or hunting of a specific species without utilizing science, doing a huge disservice to wildlife conservation, then that means we have to get all 5% of us to vote the same way, which doesn't right. happen, and we got to get 45% plus one vote. 
we're screwed. Yeah. We are screwed. And the thing is, is, is that I've looked at this over the last several years, and if hunters don't change how they portray and help change the perception with a non-hunting public about why we hunt, we are going to be banned and regulated out of existence, even in states like Montana. Because we don't, I mean, look at, look at Washington, the state of Washington, King County, Seattle. You know, that wins every single statewide election. You have to be in King County and you got to be a Democrat and you're going to win every single election. California, you know, California yeah. sets all these trends. You know, it's made up of a lot of people that are hunters. I mean, some of the highest numbers. I mean, I remember my wife told me that uh, Dick Cabela told her once that the, 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 the largest number of customers that Cabela's has ever had back in, when Dick was alive was California. Hard to believe. But, wow. you know, they got, what, 40 million, 40 some million people there, I think, or 35, 40 million. I don't know what the exact numbers are, I, but they I got a huge number of that. people. So the reality here is that, um, you know, on our Shepherds of Wildlife, um, dot org page we've actually looked at a reset for conservation and in hunting and so we have it's called a um principles of modern ethical hunter and it's not meant to be you know uh you know the commandments or anything like it's just meant to create conversation and you know being photographers and being filmmakers in the outdoors we see all these things we document sustainable utilization we're 100 percent behind it behind sound management you know based on science and so but we see what's going on in the hunting community you know, where, you know, these people post things and, and I liken it to pornography. I mean, I don't care if you, I mean, to the general public, they don't understand you holding the animal and smiling or the chest pumps or the fist pumps or the high fives or, you know, I'm, I've, I've got all these record book animals. Aren't I cool? Or I'm on a team and I'm in a sport. Well, hunting's not a freaking sport. Hunting is hunting. Hunting is sustainable. I'm not an athlete, you know. Yeah, I train to go climb the mountains. I was in Kyrgyzstan doing a project for the Wild Sheep Foundation on the Marco Polo last year. We were filming at 14,000 feet. It was one of the hardest damn hunts I've ever done in my life. And, you know, and I hunted and filmed. And I had Tony Bynum out there with me and my wife, and I had a pretty good crew of people. But, I mean, it was a, it was a bitch. And uh, cold, windy, not much oxygen. But the reality here, though, is that hunters have to stop fighting each other Hunters need to portray hunting for the right reasons. So we came up with this, this uh, principles of modern ethical hunter. And, and it addresses a lot of these things you and I have been talking about right now. And again, it's meant for conversation. But the non-hunting public is out of touch. They don't understand why we hunt. Because uh, there was a survey done in a major metropolitan public school system last fall. 40, uh, 47% of high schoolers in that school system did not know that it when they ate a burger, an animal died to feed them. 47%. Holy crap. Kids think that, you know, these people, the, the next generation thinks everything comes from the grocery store. They don't realize that the farmer does what the farmer does, the rancher does what the rancher does, the, the, the packer does what the packer does, you know, the, the, the transport, frozen transport guy does what they do, and that everything goes out, and it's all about making money for these big corporations. So you get whatever you can get as cheap as they can get it to you to make as much money off of it. That, and that just blows my mind, 47%. 47%. I, mean, I, I knew there were some people because I've had some people actually say, well, why don't you just go to the store and – and get your meat like everybody No, just ask else. them, where, where does their meat come from? Oh, the grocery store. You know. It comes I've, in a package. Yeah, I've had, I've had people, you know, say stuff like that. But it's, it's not very often. But 47%, that is. Mm -hmm. At a major, major city in the United States in a public school system. So, I mean, th so th there's a huge disconnect. Oh, yeah. So our goal with the Shepherds of Wildlife Society is to educate the broader public. But we're, we're gearing it towards kids. We're gearing it towards teachers. We're gearing it towards politicians. We're gearing it towards the media. And our goal, because we have that relationship, wild places. And we like to say, let's keep the wild in wild places and wildlife. And so the idea is for us to take our material, present it to them with these experts, telling the story in a way that's palatable, that's not the great white hunter sitting there beating on the chest. But it's also about, say, hey, guys, we might need to think about resetting what we do. And I was talking about pornography a minute ago, and let me finish that. I don't care if you're in the porn. I mean, if you are, you are, whatever. But where do you consume pornography? 
Oh, it's all over the internet. Yeah, I know, but you do it behind the door of your house, right? You oh, don't post right, pictures yeah. of your wife on your Facebook page so Aunt Mabel <laughs> right, can see yeah. it, right? Yeah. So I like it. And because there's this disconnect, and we only represent 5% of the population, and we're now having the politicization of wildlife conservation and the banning and regulation of hunting, well, it would be kind of prudent, I think, to make sure that those other, you know, 80% of the population, because we figure about 8, 5 to 10% are hunters and about 5 to 10% are vehemently anti-hunting. And it doesn't matter what you say, what the argument is, or how many facts and figures you have, they don't freaking care. So they're invested in their thing emotionally, and it's like, you know, pro-choice or right to life or, or guns or whatever that issue is. They're invested in it, and it doesn't come hell or high water. There's nothing you and I can say that will ever change their mind. That's fine. But that other 80%, they vote. Yep. Those are the people that we need to win the hearts and minds. And we're not doing it when we're out there promoting the stuff we promote on outdoor television, right. that we put on blogs, that we put on, you know, it just, it's just, it's just, it's bloody, I mean, impact shots, blood and gore, high fives, egos on display. And unfortunately, that does a huge disservice to the ultimate thing, which is keeping hunting viable as a management tool. So what we suggest to people is, Take your pictures. Yeah, I understand it. You go to, to achieve. You've spent three years tracking this one buck, and you finally were able to get an arrow in. Or you climbed this mountain and finally got that, that sheep or that mountain goat. Or, or you traveled abroad and were able to get a lion. You're proud of yourself. It's an accomplishment. You want to go back and you want to be able to, to recreate that in your mind and think about it um, because you're proud of what you've done. I, under, I get it. I understand it. Just don't post it on Facebook. Don't post it. Don't text it to anybody. Don't Snapchat. The kids are finding that out. Oh, let's uh, take a picture of my, uh, you know, my privates and send it to Joey. And yeah. oh, Joey did a <laughs> screenshot. And the next thing you know, it's on Facebook and Instagram. Oh, I don't know. So, or it's being shut all over the school. You know, yeah. to everybody else's. You know, everybody's. You know, text accounts. So my point is, is that as a hunter, we have to. If we, you know, hunters have we have lost the mantle of calling ourselves a wildlife conservationist. Because we have morphed the hunting industry and the hunting community has, has, has morphed into an egocentric approach. And, and, that, and it's not that all of us, most of us, 95% of us hunt to put food on the table and to enjoy the experience of being in the outdoors. And to, and to enjoy time with our friends and family, the camaraderie. But 5% of the hunters, I, I liken it to real estate. 5% of the realtors sell 95% of the real estate because they're the experts. Well, 5% of the hunters are the broadcasters of 95% of the wrong message. So we have to go and, and get the advertisers to buy into these ethical changes. They have to not support that. We need to get the rest of the hunting community to buy into these ethical changes. And unfortunately, we just, we can't, you know, you can't post pictures of your animals online, especially your predators or, you know, we say, you know, don't post pictures of, of uh, iconic zoo animals, right. you know. And, and then, you know, you know, simple things is, uh, you know, I was just doing a, a podcast with the guys in the city about hunting and, and helping people out. And, you know, I said, you know, one of our rules is that you always will give wild game meat every year, not to people who are unsuccessful hunters, but to people who have never had it before, not hunters. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's some great things there, but the greatest threat to the world's wildlife populations, as we said, is not obviously well-regulated hunting. It's not the poaching we hear about in Africa on the rhino horn elephant. It's us. It's the seven and a half billion people. And, um, you know, if we don't prioritize the habitat and the wildlife in our own societies, then it isn't going to exist in the future. And hunters you know, who hunt for the right reasons can literally be that last bulk work, that last defense against this tsunami, this tidal wave of humanity that's coming. And we can educate people so that we make sure within our society that these wild places stay wild and the wildlife in them stays wild. And that is the most important thing that we can leave on this earth. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Uh, one more thing real quick before, um, uh, just a quick question, because you had mentioned the wildlife, wildlife society one, shepherds wildlife. of wildlife yeah shepherds well, of wildlife .org. Before that, it was, yeah. uh you said you had a grizzly bear film yeah so we have a grizzly bear film so we do every I, we, I we've got I've a whole seen it and I, was it your wife that was in it yes okay yeah. so yeah i did see it when i first saw that and anybody out there who's a hunter or whatever and you think oh you know i, I don't know whatever you think about grizzlies or even if you're not a hunter when i first saw the caption of that I was like, oh, shit, here we go. It's another, you know, anti-grizzly hunting thing or whatever. And then <laughs> I started watching it and because, you know, I'm kind of open-minded. I want to see 
yeah. you know, what all's out there. And then I started watching. I was like, that was damn awesome. I, it was, I it appreciate was a, it. Yeah. It was a, it was a but what you're saying is true show. because we have people that humanity's lazy. Okay. Hunters are lazy and not all hunters, but they're, they're just, they reflect humanity. So we have a lot of people that just go through and just look at the caption or look at the headline and then they post something. They don't even watch it. And I can tell you, there's probably been a couple dozen people call me an anti hunter. And I'm like, what? I mean, that's like calling Superman, you know, that he's not a superhero. <laughs> yeah, I, I had reposted it, and I was like, this was not ex- not at all what I initially had expected. This was a great video and stuff like that. And I don't know if you're the one that manages your social media on that. Or, oh, I'm on it quite a bit, yeah. We got other people, somebody too. somebody else but. did, but they'd respond in there, oh, thanks, you know, for the plug or whatever, but... That was probably me. Yeah. I try I try to respond on social media every day yeah. as long as I'm winning comms because sometimes I'm in the middle of BFE and there yeah. is – I mean, we do have satellite comms and stuff, but I'm usually not on Facebook then or Instagram. Yeah. But if you po- if you come to any of our, our you know, our Wildlife Conservation Project, TWCP, that's where we have a lot of that content. Also, you can go to wildlifeconservationproject.com. You can see the content there, uh, and then you can also go to the Shepherds of Wildlife dot uh, org which is the shepherds of wildlife society our nonprofit. you can contribute to it uh you can send us messages we always respond you know tell you what we got going on what we're trying to do if you can sh- like and share stuff greatly greatly appreciate it because we've yeah. got to get the word out you know the one thing that the hunting community does a really good job of preaching to the choir yeah all of our hunting organizations all of our wildlife organizations preach to the choir really well what we do a terrible job of is talking to the broader public that's right Yep, that's right. That's, with the right message. That's one of the reasons I wanted to get in with uh, REI. I've got a seminar the 26th, and I'm talking to – traditionally, REI, a lot of the people at REI are not hunters. Granolas. So, yeah, that's what we call absolutely. Them. They're, they're so, like most people in Missoula. <laughs> so, you know, what I'm, what I'm going to start out with is how many of you guys are yuppies? How many of you guys are hippies? Well, let me tell you something, so am I. Mm-hmm. Because – conservation and everything like that you know we need to stop polluting we need to stop doing all that hey that's the same platform i stand on yeah what i like to say uh is that you know in a room of people raise your hand if you want to have clean water clean rivers clean lakes clean streams everybody raises their hand the next question is how many of you guys want healthy forests everybody raises their hand how many of you guys want vibrant wildlife populations everybody raises their hands and i've said okay let me just spell you in on something if you are against well-regulated hunting as a management tool for wildlife managers and biologists and scientists then you are against all three of those things do you understand that you're against yeah. those because that's what we are my dad told me a long time ago that the original environmentalist is the hunter and that's the truth you know, I don't want my trout stream being screwed up by chemicals or, you know, whatever. I don't want it being plowed up. I don't want it being drained, my, 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 my duck hunting marsh. Uh, I don't want my forest all cut down. But I, I'm a realist, you know. I know we need, to, we need to have boards to build my house. I know we need to have electricity. I know that, you know, we need a little bit of gold here and there so I can keep my wife happy with a, you know, with a diamond yeah. ring, you know, when she, or earrings or whatever it is. I understand that, but we have to do it smart. And we can. We have the technology to do things smart. We have the knowledge to be able to do things smart. And we have to work together. And we got to start taking, you know, I, I end every presentation with this. At the end of the day, are the decisions you made in the best interest of wildlife? Now, if you call yourself a wildlife conservationist, I don't care if you're an anti-hunter or a hunter or anything in between, you have to ask yourself that question every day. Are you making decisions that are in the best interest of wildlife and wildlife habitat? Or are they in the best interest of the dollar? Are they the best interest of your organization, your company, or your ego? Because I got guys when I say, hey, stop posting pictures of lions and elephants and zebras. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. Um, Screw you. I can do whatever I want to. Yeah, keep doing it. And you're going to get banned and regulated out of existence. Well, Facebook will be the first one to ban you. That's only a matter of time. It's already happening. I mean, look what YouTube's done with guns and hunting. So my point is, listen, I'm part of the party here i am your supporter i am here to help you so listen to me give it some thought before you jump to conclusions before you don't want to be told what to do i'm not telling you what to do i'm just telling you if you keep doing this shit you're gonna fuck it all up for everybody 
Okay? There is not going to be any wildlife. There's going to be no reason to fight over this shit because there ain't going to be any habitat. And your kids and their kids, you think they're going to get a chance to go to Africa or go to Montana and go hunt elk? Hell no. Because you're being a dumbass right now. Yep. That's, that's the key right. thing. People have to understand that every action, and I'm teaching, I got four kids between five and 15. Daddy's like, hey guys, for every action, there's what? Equal and opposite reaction. Reaction, exactly. <laughs> and they all say that, including the five year old now. So it's like, I'm just telling you, you don't make dad happy, dad's going to be mad. So, um, but, you know, the reality here is that, is that we all love the outdoors as hunters and fishermen. Um, you know, the people that aren't into hunting that still love the outdoors love it just as much as we do. It's all of ours. We, we have a responsibility. And as humans on this planet, being intelligent beings here, we have a responsibility to keep this place better and left better than the way we found it. I agree. Thank you very much. I, oh, I really, really appreciate it, man. This is okay. a great conversation. Let's go eat some lunch. Yes, sir.